Okay, welcome. I hope you've had the chance to increase your energy levels, either through your uh, delicate lunch down here at Atlantic Hotel or either in your home office. Before we dig into the next topic, we are going to ask you a new question. So I want you to take out your mobile phone, go to slider.com, and find your next questions. We want to test what are your expectations on when we will see the next wind farm in operation offshore Norway. And, and then we're thinking, uh, excluding the high wind tampon, which is on in 22. So do you expect to see a new offshore wind in five years, seven years, 10 years? Or for those who are more pessimistic, never. So while you're enjoying that, uh, Paul, we'll move on to the next topic. Before the break, we looked at major potential in offshore wind. We saw willingness to invest and deliver on projects. We heard politi political leaders wanting to make it happen abroad and in Norway. But there might be some obstacles that we need to overcome. How to make different ocean industries coexist in the same waters? And what have we learned from the oil and gas history? To guide us through this debate, we're glad that Frank Emil Moen, which is, represents the Innovation Energy and the Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster, will join us. He will lead the debate, but I'd also like to invite representatives from relevant industries. Geir Lasse Taranger from the Norwegian Institute of Marine Research, Siri Medling from the Norwegian Directorate of Fisheries, and Ture Øygrad from the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association. The floor and the debate is yours. Welcome. Dear audience, uh, yes, uh, I'm working for Energy Innovation and Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster uh, as a communication manager for Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster and as a managing director for Energy Innovation in Negesund. Uh, my background and maybe why I'm going to have this panel debates uh, is that I'm actually a marine biologist. Uh, so I'm on my spare time, I'm <laughs> writing books about marine life. Uh, seventh edition just came uh, last, uh, last week, uh, and of course the interest for marine life combined with uh, working with offshore wind is interesting, and uh, due to the fact that we need more competence on the impact of uh, introducing offshore wind, both bottom fix and floating, uh, in our waters, or, or in, the, in the waters of Europe, and of course the plans uh, we have heard about what we are expecting of installation is so huge. We have 22 gigawatts of offshore wind at the moment in, in Europe altogether. And uh, the Commission has stated between 400 and 450 gigawatt uh, in 2050. So it's uh, and 212 in, uh, in the North Sea and Norwegian waters and 30 of these gigawatts may be in Norwegian waters. So the industrial development in this ocean space is huge. So what we want to discuss in this debate is what are the impacts, what are the conflicts when we are introducing so much wind power offshore in an ocean space that is filled with activities already. Uh, so Basically, uh, I, will, I will also mention that there are, of course, why we are building this offshore wind. Uh, we have to remember uh, also for the fisheries, for example, that the, the fish has a problem if the acidification of the ocean goes on, because the high level of carbon dioxide is getting the ocean with a lower pH, and then the phytoplankton and the plankton that are the nutrition for the fishes will actually disappear. And that's not good for the fisheries, for sure. So we have to cope with both these challenges. How to produce more sustainable renewable energy and to protect 
the life in the ocean. So, uh, Guy Lasse, you are representing uh, Havforskningsinstituttet, uh, and uh, you have uh, a bright knowledge about, uh, about uh, marine life, of course, uh, from surveys done, but I believe that we still miss some, we need a lot more information about the impact of, uh, of these huge installations that we are talking about. So, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, and first of all, thank you for inviting me here to this exciting conference. So uh, I really enjoyed this uh, morning. So I'm vice director at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen, and um, uh, let's see if this works. No. Um, could could we get some uh, action on the? I can maybe try okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so basically, uh, so our role in, in Norway is to provide uh, advice to the government and to, to, to the society in general about how to uh, take care of marine life. Uh, and um, that includes, of course, uh, having, uh, giving advice on ecosystem, fisheries, aquaculture and seafood. But we are also conducting quite heavy uh, mapping and monitoring of the ecosystems. Uh, and we also do some experimental studies regarding for example, the impact of noise and electromagnetic uh, impulses on marine life. So when it comes to um, uh, offshore wind, uh, of course, uh, some of the features will be that uh, both during the construction phase and also during the operation phase, we have issues with noise. We have uh, issues with electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation from the cables. There will be some physical changes and also um, uh, what we are con uh, really uh, considering is the ecosystem fragmentation, so we should not sort of divide the marine space into very small, tiny places. And there are many uh, organisms that can be affected, but still the knowledge is relatively limited. Um, we have some knowledge that, uh, uh, that noise can affect uh, migration and reproduction in some of the species. Uh, and we have seen some uh, in, in evidence for food web alterations in relation to, um, to, for example, when you install a lot of uh, wind farms, you make sort of uh, artificial reefs that would sort of uh, change uh, the distribution, which also could be positive. So it's not necessarily negative, this uh, artificial reef. And also, as a, in, in a way, this could also um, protect some... Uh, fish stocks from, from too heavy fishing pressure. So it's not ne necessarily negative. So uh, I think what, what we, but by, by and large, we have um, still a limited knowledge of the impacts. And also maybe equally important, we have um, not done a sufficient mapping in, in, the, in the actual areas. For example, now with the Sören Norsjön 2 and Utsira uh, Nord, we would recommend to do some, uh, some uh, mapping as soon as possible to identify if there are, uh, for example, coral reefs uh, or to also to define more precisely where the sand eel have their uh, living areas and spawning grounds. So what we could recommend is uh, basically to, uh, as soon as possible, to get, uh, get ahead with the mapping, um, both for, let's say, corals, uh, fish species, but also to do some more um, experimental biology. So. Um, so we, we have, uh, just this week, uh, we are coming up with a new report where we give us an overview of the state of the art and we also provide some recommendations for what we should do in the near future when it comes to uh, mapping, doing some experiments, and, and we think it's very urgent that we get ahead with this. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there uh, and, and come back to more details in the debate. Thank, thank you very much, Gerd Lasse. Uh, <laughs> Siri, uh, we don't have the representatives from the, the Fisher Boat Association or, or Fiskarlaget, but uh, you are very well known about the, the conflict areas connected to the use of those ocean space for the fisheries. So, so please uh, tell us a little about, uh, about the challenges towards these conflicts. Thank you, Frank Emil, and thank you for the invitation and opportunity to, to talk about offshore wind from a fishery perspective and how we can have a happy uh, coexistence. Uh, the Directorate of Fisheries shall promote profitable economic activity 
through sustainable and user-oriented uh, management of marine resources and marine environment. And uh, as you mentioned, of course, the, the fisheries are highly depending on a good environment in our oceans, and we fully support the strategy for building more renewable energy in order to, to fight the, the, the climate uh, changes. Um, here, you can see um, how the fishery is, is, uh, is uh, the activity along the coastline. But this map is also showing how great oceans Norway has. Our economic zone is six times the land area in Norway, so it's a huge, huge, huge ocean. And Norway is the second largest fish exporter nation in the world. Uh, we export seafood for more than uh, 100 billion Norwegian kronos, and approximately 30,000 are employed in the industry. And if we act in a sustainable way, the fishery will have the perspective of eternity. And that's important to keep in mind. We have a lot of sea areas, but uh, we also have many different stakeholders who want to use those areas. Offshore wind industry is, of course, one in interest, as we are discussing today. But we have a lot of oil and gas activities, platforms, seabed, cables, and pipelines. And also offshore fish farming is about to, to develop, same as uh, mining. And we also have uh, protected areas, in addition to ship, uh, ship lines and also, of course, the fishing uh, activities. Our vision in the directorate is that uh, marine life is our common responsibility. And uh, for the directorate of fisheries, as well as for the fishermen's organization, August uh, Fiskalag, we want to be positive to other industry and activities, also to offshore wind industry. But we need to have good dialogue and good planning. Uh, we have to uh, have respect for each other's interests and challenges, and we need knowledge and good communication for sharing ocean space. Uh, fisheries can last forever, but need sustainable solutions for the ocean environment, spawning areas, juveniles, and for the fishing activity itself. Oh. Here. Here you can see the areas of offshore wind and also several areas suggested for offshore fish farming. And if you look at the Utsira North, you can look into the potential for combining different activities. And if we can combine different activities, it might be less conflicts. Um, example could be best practice at Utsira North, where we could have blue offshore wind approved area, and the shaded is a proposed offshore fish farming area. And for both those areas, fishing activity was assessed at an early stage in the planning and taken into account. And if you can combine offshore wind and offshore um, fish farming, the co conflict might be even further reduced. But the critical factor is early planning. Um, and we, the Directory of Fisheries, we expect to be a herring agency in the same way as for petroleum-related plants. And the spawning and juvenile areas and marine mammals need to be assessed. That's your job, to give us good advices. Uh, we need to have spatial uh, planning early. We have to locate offshore wind uh, to areas with limited fishing interests. Uh, and we need uh, we look at the space that is being occupied on the surface. For instance, Highwind Tampen, uh, there is 11 square kilometers on the surface, but on the seabed it's 22 um, uh, kilometers that is occupied. So, and it, it's that total area that matters for the, for the fishery. And we consider it um, unrealistic to um, expect commercial fishing in between the wind turbines. Uh, and we must take cables and pipelines into consideration too. Uh, we expect these to be placed along with existing cables. And of course, we expect all components to be removed after decommissioning. So I think uh, we have enough space. Uh, we don't need to use area 
uh, where there will be conflicts. With the good knowledge, good dialogue, early planning, um, we could make this uh, success history for the Norwegian industry and also for the fisheries. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sidi. Um, Turi, uh, you are representing the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association, and you have uh, a long, quite long history connected to the conflicts uh, with the use of ocean space for oil and gas activity. So, so please uh, tell us a little bit. You maybe uh, do you see? Do you want to come here or? No, I, I can stay here. Okay, yeah. that's fine. So, so thank you for inviting me. I'll talk about uh, learning from oil and gas history with regards to coexistence. For eight, eight last years, I've worked with coexistence questions in the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association, and I think we can learn from our experience on how to work with these questions. And I will repeat, repeat some of what you already said, but that's how it is. Um, we can use some of the same methods that we are using today, now that we are talking about wind power. The oil and gas have more than 25 years of experience in uh, a systematic dialogue with the Norwegian Fishermen's Association. But I think that the reason I am invited here today is that in 2018, the Norwegian Oil and Gas Association extended our criteria for membership to all kinds of energy production in the ocean, and we also included ocean mining. So, last year, we established our Renewable Offshore Energy Forum. The purpose of this forum is to initiate, implement and follow up common positions and strategies for the development of renewable ocean energy, including an offshore wind industry for the continental shelf and cover future production, export and relevant supply chains. And as you can see from the members of uh, this forum, we have members that are trying, that want to be operators of wind farms in the sea, and we also have the supply industry present in our forum. Uh, we have made ourselves four main goals for an offshore wind industry in Norway. The first is, of course, that it has to be profitable. We need to develop profitable and competitive industry, which is attractive for national and international investors. And we need jobs. Ensure jobs in Norway in all the different phases. And of course, climate is part of the goal reduce CO2 emissions nationally and internationally. And then the fourth goal is coexistence. Ensure coexistence between different business interests at the continental shelf, including shipping and petroleum activities, and establishing systems for dialogue and coexistence with the fisheries. We call this our last to operate to manage coexistence between fisheries and oil and gas, and we are using different tools to reduce the level of conflict. And this is what I think we can bring on now to the wind industry. Uh, we have had some conflicts uh, between the two industries. The main conflict is the area conflict, when oil and gas seize large areas to collect seismic and fishermen want to use the same areas at the same time to fish. In most cases, this conflict can be avoided with competence and dialogue at an early stage. If those planning to collect seismic, for instance at Trampen, know at what time of the year the mackerel fishing is going on, they won't plan collecting seismic at that time of the year if they find another time slot. And that is a very difficult uh, thing to find, because then the IMR in the spring, IMR advise against uh, seismic because of the spawning, and in August, the fishery directorate advise against because of the mackerel. So if you have nice weather in July, you might have a time slot. 
And if the, the weather is bad, it's worse. So this is um, how we are, have been working. And the tools used to avoid conflicts are the same as you said. Or maybe I will add framework, meeting places, dialogue and respect, knowledge, and utilizing each other's competence. So to establish a system for dialogue and co coexistence for new offshore wind industry, we need a framework. When we have licenses um, to build wind farms, after the construction phase of offshore wind parks, the windmills will be present for many years. And another time slot is not the solution for the fisheries. Um, there is a need to define whether the acreage for the new offshore wind industry should be exclusively used for the wind parks, or if it should be a business park uh, where many industries can operate. I don't expect that the answer will be the one or the other, but something in between. Uh, but if there is granted an exclusive right to acreage, then the planning phase is much easier. <laughs> Um, but there is a need to define the framework for planning. And the answer of the rights to the acreage will define what kind of analysis we need to make. Uh, who else is utilizing the same acreage where the wind parks are planned? What kind of fisheries will take place? Is there spawning in the area? Um, one part of the analysis will be dialogue with the other industries uh, and also with the authorities um, uh, and mainly with the fisheries. Our experience is that we need meeting places where industry meet with the fisheries, authorities and the best of the research uh, and get presentations uh, and build common knowledge and know each other and know what is the knowledge status. So, coexistence is not easy. It will not be easy. But my most optimistic sentence, and the last one, uh, is if we succeed with the work of, on framework, analysis and systematic dialogue, there is a better chance that we find synergies that will strengthen the business for both the fisheries and the offshore wind industry. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's interesting, just to follow up uh, your presentation, um, that uh, we have Harvin Tampen, that is actually a uh, floating in farm being erected very close to the oil and gas fields. And this is actually a, a conflict area for the fisheries. Mm -hmm. This states that, okay, fishing is going on very close to the oil and gas uh, operations and uh, uh, maybe for for people not uh, have learned about it, it sounds a little bit strange that uh, we are able to do fisheries very close to the oil and gas installations. Mm -hmm. But this means that there is some kind of coexistence between oil and gas and the fisheries. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you then: uh, you have you have partly said it, uh, I guess. Uh, have, have the Norwegian uh, industry in this aspect been good enough uh, in the dialogue with, uh, with uh, the fisheries? Are yeah. you asking? Yeah, Tudi, you could, you could uh, answer <laughs> <sorry>. short. Short. <laughs> uh, we are trying hard, and most often I think we succeed, but not always. Okay. Yeah, Siri. Yes, uh, I think this is a process, learning by doing, and uh, Tampen, unfortunately, uh, is a bad example of dialogue. Uh, but it's important to, to, to learn and to move on. And I think also Equinor um, says the same, that they can improve on, uh, on planning and dialogue. And hopefully we will see better examples in the future. Now they are working on Utsiranur, and I know that Arco, for instance, has a very good uh, dialogue with the f uh, fishery uh, and, and also uh, with the fishery of uh, the directorate. And uh, I think that... Uh, if you have a good dialogue, if you have early, early planning, we have enough space to have a good uh, coexistence. So, so uh, we should learn from, from Tampen and, and move mm. on and do it better. And I'm sure we can do it better. And we have a lot of experience 
from the oil and gas industry uh, together with the fisheries. Not everything has been very good there either, but we are, are learning and we know how to improve. And I think what you said about framework, places to meet, it's very important to have this good uh, coexistence. Okay, also. I think one key question here is that uh, to reduce conflicts and improve dialogue, you need knowledge. And I think uh, uh, what, what we really need now is to speed up uh, data collection and knowledge uh, building. Uh, now we have these two defined areas with the Utsira Nord and Sören Nordsjön uh, uh, too. And, and I think um, we should really um, tap into that, do a, a really good mapping and also to do the, let's say the most needed um, experiments, because that, that will help to, to resolve the conflicts, because then you will end up with, with, uh, with uh, discussing things where we have facts and not just speculations. So I think it's very urgent now, to, to, if we want to have progress in this field, that we invest quite heavily in these two particular areas whether it's uh, studying the sand eel in the Sören Nordsjön 2, which is uh, partly in conflict, but there's probably a lot of space left. And also with the Utsira Nord, there might be some coral reefs and, and, and other resources that we could pinpoint more directly. So I think that would be a first step and, and really urgent one. Hmm. And just a question then, do you think that it is the, the government's responsibility to, get, uh, to give uh, you the support for actually doing this service? Or do you think this is going to be done by the industry? And in how fast? Uh, well, this is about who is going to develop the, the fields. Uh, I, I think since these are quite large areas, and, uh, and also I, th I think the public sector has to do the first screening uh, up front now. And uh, for example, we could utilize the Mariano program where I'm uh, on the board to actually go in and, and do mapping mm. because and then maybe later on uh, when we when there's a specific proposal they could do more high resolution studies but i think it's uh, the public sector should uh, do the first step now both in terms of mapping and also doing some experiments so we could resolve some of the most pressing issues and then later on industry uh, could do more detailed studies but of course there could be uh, some good, uh, let's say, collaboration also up front. Uh, mm. but, but I think the public sector has to take some responsibility as well. Yeah, okay. Siri? Yeah, I think so too, a combination, because uh, it's important to use, for instance, Highland Tampen to, to do some research uh, and use this opportunity. But uh, I think it's important to stress that the fisheries, they, it's a dynamic picture, because it's not the same every year. Uh, so that may, makes it more challenging to plan. But we have a lot of statistics. Uh, the vessels, we knew the, know their positions, so we know where they are going uh, with the vessels from decades back. So, but but it's, it's challenging to do this kind of planning because it's not it's moving all the time. Yeah, uh, a, a question to you, Gaël uh, as a marine biologist, and, and uh, I'm I'm very fond of the animals in the sea. So uh, for the animals, actually, to have a wind farm is not too bad because, as you mentioned, you will have actually a higher biodiversity. You are creating a nursery for fish. Uh, fish. Uh, and so, so my question is: Is it so bad to have some of these nature? Uh, reservoirs uh, in the ocean space where fishermen are not allowed to do the fishing? So, so, so there are maybe some benefits. So, so I think also one of the reasons why the fishermen are eager to be close to the oil and gas uh, installation is that there will be this uh, artificial reef uh, effect. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we have also now with the climate changes and also the, the uh, let's say, uh, foreign species jumping in, this yep. could also be the stepping stone. So, so I think we have to have a, a, a picture of how we can actually uh, avoid that uh, our ecosystems uh, flips into a, a non-productive state, for example, yep. resulting in a lot of jellyfish. So, so I think we, it's, it's not straightforward, this one. No, for sure. Siri, uh, <coughs> uh, you were mentioning that the combination of fishing inside the wind farms uh, and running the wind farms was not, not uh, uh, possible. Uh, I have read some reports that states that it is possible and there are some, some uh, for example, fishing with pots and, and things like that. Uh, do you have any more comments on that? Or? Of course, there might be some possibilities, but I think uh, that uh, 
when we think when we put an area for offshore wind industry, it should be dedicated to offshore wind industry. Uh, and I think the, the way we can combine this area might be on fish farming, offshore fish farming, but uh, but not in traditional fishery. I don't think that that is uh, possible. Oh, okay. Um, I also read uh, last night a report from a student, a master student, that has uh, uh, learned about what was the approach from the industry at Windfloat Atlantic. This is also a floating wind farm in Portugal. And uh, sorry to say, there was no dialogue with the fisheries at all in the process up front. So, of course, we have to learn. To it. Yeah, I think uh, that that's a bit special in Norway. We have um, uh, culture and uh, history where we need to talk with the fisheries, and we do that. And uh, but I would, if I could go back on what you yeah. said, I really hope that the authorities will start now to do the environmental analysis on the two opened areas, so that we, before it's li licensed, we have a chance to know which part is actually uh, open. Yeah. Where, can, ca where can the industry start? And this should have been done last year, not next year. Yeah, but it's a good point. Uh, the government has uh, uh, appointed uh, a possibility to, uh, to apply for a uh, uh, research network uh, mm -hmm. now, coming up with 120 million uh, in support. And uh, I think there is going to be a decision in in, uh, during this year, uh, which initiative that will get it. And of course, a lot of the uh, research connected to, to offshore wind and the impacts on it could be put into these uh, initiatives. Uh, so, so that's very good. Uh, what we see, uh, if I take the hat of Norwegian Offshore Wind Cluster and the 187 member companies that are now part of this cluster, uh, several of them are uh, actually looking into what they could do on the technical basis to, to improve the methods for survivance, uh, both upfront and uh, also during the, the operation of the wind farm. So there is a, a, a huge interest from the industry, from businesses, to be together with the, both the, the governments and the research institutes to, to develop methods to get this better knowledge. So um, I'm not sure. I, I'm quite. I'm not sure about the time frame now. But uh, is it? Oh, we still have time left. Oh, good. <laughs> we got some extra time. <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, how, have you been studying? Uh, because we, we don't have any wind farms in Norway yet, so we don't have the experience. But uh, in in the British sector, of course, there are uh, a lot of uh, of information from from service. We had a seminar on the 14th of October, uh, and a researcher from from Norse, uh, in example, he had a presentation where he presented all the service has been done towards the impact of marine life. And I think he said something about close to 300 different research reports uh, that was looking into the different impacts uh, on marine life, both above uh, sea level and under. So I think we have uh, uh, quite an information base already. But what do you think about floating versus bottom fixed? My idea is that floating wind farms will have less impact on the environment than bottom fixed. Are you agree? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, regarding, so we are just uh, this week uh, uh, presenting a new report on, uh, on, on the state of the art, uh, referring to some of the studies you are, are pointing to, uh, and, and uh, where we're also discussing uh, the bo bottom fixed versus the floating uh, approach. And, uh, and certainly you uh, for example, one of the issues with, with the bottom fix is, is in the installation phase uh, with uh, a lot of uh, noise that can be quite detrimental, although that can be mitigated by bubble, air bubbles and so forth. Uh, so, so we also believe that uh, the, the floating would have less impact. Um, also, uh, notably, uh, floating would give access to areas where there might be less conflict. So, for example, the Utsira Nur, which is quite deep, uh, Although there might be, um, I, I mean, I'm not saying there's nothing <laughs> to, to protect there, but, but probably less conflict than on the shallow area. So you have like a double benefit. You have probably less impact by itself, but also the siting could be more beneficial. Interesting. 
city? Yeah, I think uh, from uh, from the fishery perspective, it uh, it matters if, if it's bottom fixed or or uh, floating because uh, the floating um, wind park will probably take a greater area because of the anchors and so on. Mm -hmm. You see it. Uh, I mentioned Tampen, mm -hmm. uh, which is 11 kilometers on the surface, but 22 square kilometers on the on the uh, seabed. So. Um, and it's difficult uh, for the fishing gear and to, to maneuver uh, within those anchors, so probably you will need a quite big safety zone around uh, this uh, offshore or floating uh, floating uh, wind. Okay. And um, I think that uh, um, the person from, from Wind Europe mentioned the potential in the North Sea. Uh, I need to mention that, of course, the North Sea is also very important from the fishery perspective mm. because it's not that deep so there is a lot of fishery going on there and of course the North Sea is convenient because it's quite close to the European market mm. um, but we have very big uh, areas sea areas uh, so maybe we also need to think that we must do something outside the North Sea too it might cost more we might need some more cables and so on. We don't have the same infrastructure. It's more distant from the market, but it will be less conflicts probably uh, with the fisheries. Even if we move them from, uh, from the British and the European sector up to the Norwegian sector? Do you think this as a... Yeah, because uh, <laughs> a it's a, the, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of catching going on in the yeah. North Sea. Yeah. So it's a very popular area for both the oil and gas business uh, wind business, but also for the fisheries, and I guess that yeah. you can confirm this from uh, from your point of view as well. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I was planning to make the same point. Uh, floating will take more space. Yeah. So, but but then it can be further away from shore, mm. and uh, maybe you can find areas with less conflict. But what what is needed is to analyze what which businesses are there and what other businesses should be there. Uh, and to conclude, do we have a safety zone or not? Then it's, we can start planning. Yeah, okay, Lasse. Yeah, so, so one thing is that, of course, also we foresee that there will be development in, in the fishing techniques because uh, current techniques are not necessarily what we should do in the future when it comes to uh, habitat destruction, use of energy, mm -hmm. in trawling and so forth. So, so that could also be a, a way ahead to go for more passive fishing gear, like uh, uh, um, traps with, uh, you know, that, that could be more environmentally friendly, that could be combined with these structures. And also, for example, notably when you're speaking about, uh, we have some ideas about uh, kelp farming and at large scale both as a feed resource, but also as a carbon capture feature mm. that could potentially be combined with uh, floating offshore farms uh, over the more deeper water, because then what would fall off the, these farms would potentially become a carbon sink. So that I think mm. that's an exciting uh, thing that we should uh, study more in detail, then you can have many benefits uh, from that. So I think combining new fishing gears with also maybe thinking more about the aquaculture opportunities that are out there could be kind of uh, where we are moving in the future. And in the future with the wind farms, you might have batteries. Hmm. We, have, we didn't talk a lot about synergies yet, but then the, the marine traffic could um, get batteries offshore. Yeah, the supply of, uh, of green uh, hydrogen. Yep. From, from the production from in farms, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, topics that the industry are looking, of course, into. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, I think this was a very good uh, debate, and I thank you very much. Uh, so? What happens, now, uh, what happens now is that what you're asking. Yeah. I'd like to say thank you, all of you, for joining us. It's uh, it would been a great pleasure, so please give them a hand. <laughs>
and we need to listen to, to their concerns before they get into conflicts. And history actually shows that we have been able to do that in the oil and gas industry. 